So uh, I'm deeply insecure. I mean, we all are, but I, I'm really deeply insecure. And, and one of the worst things I do when I chair an event is when I have to introduce the keynote speaker, because the keynote speakers have always done so much more than me, and I sort of always sort of feel I shrink inside. And, and with our keynote speaker tonight, it's no different. I, I spent my time in the taxi, and I felt I was shrinking to a little Miss Pepperpot uh, size. So um, <laughs> it's a great honor to... Um, introduce David Roberts, so just to, so we can all feel insecure. He's um, one of the world's leading experts on exponential and disruptive technology. He's a decorated special agent. I don't know what that, quite that means, but it scares me. Um, <laughs> military officer, he's an award-winning CEO. He's also an MIT engineer, Harvard MBA, and two-time director of Singularity University's <laughs> graduate studies program. I sort of, I shrink. Um, but he's also a really nice guy, which helps, which makes me, help me come back to my normal size, because he, he's, he's a lovely man, he's got great ideas, he really is helping to change the world. Um, so the floor is yours, David. Thank, thank you, Joe. Kind, kind words, thank you. Ah, Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests. Um, so I have the, the pleasant job of talking about technology, which fortunately is one of my favorite things to, to speak about. Um, you know, we've all experienced technology, but there's actually been some very interesting discoveries that have been made just in the last few years that, that give us a very different outlook on, on where we can potentially go. So I'll talk a little about technology, but I'll actually talk today more, I think, about the global issues that we have and, and how technology might dovetail into that to help to solve it. So you can't start a technology talk without talking a little bit about math. <laughs> uh, and so we'll do that really quick, just so everybody gets it. And, and it's really the difference between linear and exponential. And, and linear just means, and it's something that we all get, right? That if I take a step forward and I go up a meter, then I'm a meter high. And I go 10 steps, I'm 10 meters high. And 20 steps, 20 meters high. 30 steps, 30 meters high. Now let's do that with exponential steps. Now I double it each time. So I go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. At 7 steps, I'm already at 128. At 10 steps, I'm at 1,000. At 20 steps, I'm at a million. And at 30 steps, I'm a billion meters high, which is like 32 times around the Earth. So it's a staggering amount of growth. And the amazing discovery that we've really had is that there are some technologies that actually double in their price performance just like that. And so in the beginning, it looks like almost nothing is happening. And then later on, it gets almost remarkable, hard to even believe or understand. And you know, this is that curve of disappointment that we get with technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics. And then slowly we get to this point that we're kind of at now, where they're just surpassing that and we're kind of amazed. So I'll give you an example of this, right? You've probably all heard that your cell phone is more powerful than all of the, rock, all of the computers that were on the rocket that went to the moon. Who's heard that? Yeah, everyone. The truth is that your cell phone is more powerful than all of the computers that NASA and the entire Northern Air Defense had. And you get that now in your pocket for $200. All of the computers that the entire Northern Air Defense and NASA had for a couple hundred bucks. And the point is simply that that phone has a billion times better price performance than it did say all of the computers did 30 or 40 years ago. So a staggering result, and of course we all kind of benefit for that. The thing that I think we have a hard time understanding is that the curve doesn't stop. And so all of that development that we just saw happen in the last 20, 30 years is not only about to happen in the next 30, but because it's exponential, it goes even faster. And here's the other interesting thing. So I didn't say technology was exponential. I said the price performance of technology is exponential. Sort of how much computing power do you get, say, for $1,000? What it also means is this. Even if a technology doesn't get any better, 
like solar cells, even if solar cells get no better in performance, as long as they keep having in price, which they've been doing for the last 30 years, that too is an exponential technology. And so you can see in 1977 how that exponential price kept having, 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 and now we're down to just 36 cents for a watt from solar. And if you want to see really what that looks like on a better chart, so Henry Hub, Bitmus Coal, Brent, that's just natural gas, crude oil, liquefied natural gas. That's the price of all of those energy technologies. And see this weird crayon mark here? <laughs> that's solar crashing right through that line. And it's not going to stop. And we're actually only seven doublings away, 15 years away, from solar being a hundred times less expensive than it is today. Which is a really exciting result for a world like ours that we're having so much trouble keeping cool. And so you can watch that solar capacity in just 25 years is very likely to be the capacity of all of the energy that we need. Now, of course, it only works when there's sun out. And so we got to you know, build these windmills and build dams and some other things and probably some good energy sources to make sure that that whole system works. But that's the, that's the positive glimpse. The other really positive glimpse and discovery we had is that it wasn't just computers that were exponential, but it was networks and sensors and artificial intelligence and robotics. And now even biology has become exponential. The price to read DNA and to print DNA has been dropping exponentially. It used to be half a billion dollars to sequence the human genome, and today you can do that for about 400 bucks. And in another 10 years, it'll be free. Nanotechnology and digital fabrication and 3D printing, all of these are exponential. That's very positive news for us. Here's some good examples of it. So this is the slingshot. Dean Kamen is a wonderful inventor in the United States, and he created this machine, and in it, you can put anything liquid, including human or animal refuse, and out the other end comes injectably pure water. And he's built that machine. And Coca-Cola now is merged with him to help deliver and move that machine around the world. Here's another one, Craig Venter. He's a synthetic biologist. And he's created an algae which uses sunlight and salt water and CO2 out of the air and creates fuel, methane. So think about that. It cleans the air while it creates fuel. And now Exxon has partnered with him to try and do that on a very large scale. This is a company called Modern Meadow, and they actually have taken a yeast that grows leather. So you can actually take like a cell off of a cow and grow leather like you grow yogurt. And you can do that almost a hundred times more efficiently than you can by growing cows, which actually produce a lot of methane, which is really bad again for our whole global warming and global temperature. And so these adoption rates, if you see them, it took 70 years for the cell phone, for the telephone to get adopted. And now we see it growing faster and faster. The internet only took about 15 years. You look across a whole broad set of technologies, all of these things happening together, and our future looks incredibly bright. And technologists actually believe that we will enter into a world of abundance. <laughs> So, here's the issue. What does this picture say about who we are? Because technology gets us stuff, but it doesn't change who we are. That's, that's a linear path. This is a, a real photo. It hurts me every time I look at it. Taken of a girl, and she is crawling to a food station that is located more than a kilometer away. And Kevin Carter, who took the photo, won the Pulitzer Prize for that photo. And then he was asked, well, what happened to the girl? And he didn't know. 
and I judged him for it. Who would leave a girl crawling with a vulture behind it? And then I realized, gee, I don't know if I'm any better than Kevin Carter. I mean, I know people are starving. What am I doing about it? It's just Kevin happened to be closer. Sadly, Kevin took his life three weeks after that. It's a lesson, I think, for us about our responsibilities. And, you know, it's not just Africa. This is Europe. I have photos from the U.S. I'm sure you, there's photos in every country in the world. Uh, and it's not even just food. It turns out that 50% of the hospitalizations in the world come from people who drank bad water. And I don't know about you, but I have never in my life had to worry where my next glass of clean water was going to come from. Even in Air Force survival school, they actually give us clean water because it's that bad. And of course, it's not just water, right? This is population of the world, which also looks very exponential. I mean, it's just a rocket going up. And with that rocket going up, we've got to feed those people. And when you feed people, you've got to basically deforest and create farms. And you create food, which creates animals that produce methane, and then you produce power, which produces more CO2, and this builds up. And the problem with the buildup isn't just that it builds up, it's that right now, the Earth is still a net carbon absorber. But we're approaching this point where it may tilt. And then the Earth becomes a net carbon producer. And if it becomes a net carbon producer, it becomes very difficult for us to understand how we will ever rein that back. This is all the water in the world. 98% of it is salt water. 1% of it is the ice cap. The other 1%, which is a dot too small to show on the chart, is actually all the fresh water in the world that we all share. In other words, we live in a fishbowl of water. <laughs> and this is all the air uncompressed in the world. And I don't know if you've ever had one of these or if you remember seeing one of these, but I had one as a kid. And it's just a sealed ball. And in it, there's some shrimp that produce CO2. And then there's some algae on the plant that take the CO2 and produce oxygen. And so they live in this cycle. But the thing is, it only lasts about a week. <laughs> And then it all kind of, the impurities build up, it turns cloudy and everything dies. And unfortunately, many of the scientists in the world think now that our world is a lot like that. And if it's a lot like that, and we have all of these problems, then things might not look so good. But here's the truth. All of the problems on this chart, more than a billion people in the world suffer from. Global health, water, clean water, energy, environment, food, education. Every one of them we can solve in the next 20 years. In fact, some of them, like food, we could have solved 20 years ago. And that is something that was never possible before. And now, because of technology, it actually is possible to solve all of those problems. You could reproduce Dean Kamen's slingshot water machine and distribute that around the world and you would solve the world's water problem today. Which is something I think that you know, companies like Coca-Cola and things are hoping to, to actually do. But this is our world, right? This is our spaceship. <laughs> I mean, we're on it together. And even though we grew as separate nations, we're in one spaceship. And we got to recognize that together we own the air and the water and the environment and everything else in it. Here's the other great news. We've solved these problems before. We had an ozone hole that was growing out of control. And we actually all got together. And the last two years, the ozone hole has actually shrunk. And so we've solved these problems before. Now we just need to recognize that we've got eight more of them. And the next 20 years, we need to make a decision that we want to solve those eight problems. How do we make a difference? I'm going to show that you a video. A huge and you're going to wonder, what is this video up. about and how does this relate? And I'll, huge I'll show you that afterwards. But this is a big African buffalo. Strolling along with mama buffalo and baby buffalo behind. They don't know it, but they're about to stroll into a pride of lions. They're crouching. She's quite big. 
Now, I'll warn you ahead of time, it's a little bit gruesome. <laughs> what are we going to do? You see, this buffalo actually smells the lions before he sees them. The video is about four and a half minutes long. There he goes, running. Oh my God. Survival of the fittest. They, they go after the baby. Oh She's, going for, him. She's going for him. She's going for him. She got him. Oh, she did. She got him. Maybe he's, he's gone. He's just popped a buffalo yet. Oh, my God. Now, lions, you don't see them swimming. They actually do know how to swim. They just know better than to swim. Uh, because these waters are also infested. He's trying to drag him out. With They're dragging him out. So they want to get the baby out of the water as fast as possible. It's on its back. I want you to watch this area of the water right here. Oh, it's so wide. See that? That was a lion, a uh, crocodile that just snapped at that male lion. Look at this. Oh, now the crocodile's got the baby. Oh my god. The two crocodiles. They're going to lose it. Two crocodiles. Oh my God. Crocodiles, by the way, weigh about 2,000 pounds. Lions are only about three or four hundred. Oh, he's coming for huge crocodiles. Oh, look at those. Oh, the lions have won. There we go. Lions win. Oh, the lions have won. The lions are so focused on this whole crocodile issue <laughs> that they weren't paying attention to what the other African buffalo have all decided. Oh, look at the teeth. And they want their baby back. Now, there's the smartest lion right there. I don't know if you saw that one run away. And normally, buffalo run away from lions, right? Now, watch this. You guys, you cannot believe what's going on here. There's a big barrier between lions, crocodiles, and buffalo. Look at them all. There's a buffalo here that's going to get a crazy thought right there. Did you see that? Whoa. That buffalo just charged a lion. He swatted at him and kicked at him. And it worked. He's kicking at him. Look. And he realized, oh, okay, at him. I'm going to start chasing lions. Now, this is a weird thing if you missed the beginning and you came on this, right? Now watch this. There's another one. Boom. Uh-oh. Ow, that's going to hurt. Look at that. Now they all get the idea. There's the baby. The calf's still alive. It is? Yeah, it's trying to get away. It's standing up. It is, it's still alive. It's standing up. It's standing up. It's running away. There we go. The baby walks away. I don't know if there's a word for this, but this is what we would call stubbornness if it was humans. <laughs> Still holding their ground, even though they don't have the uh, buffalo anymore. Chased them away. And sure enough, they chase all seven lions away. There's this brief moment here. Where this lion just kind of looks back like, what just happened? What do we get from that? Perpetrators, collaborators, bystanders, victims. Not that lions are bad, but I'm pretty sure we were all rooting for the baby African buffalo. Perpetrators, collaborators, bystanders, victims. We can be clear about three of these categories. The bystander, however, is the fulcrum. What does that mean? Because <laughs> I didn't get it the first time I read this quote. In any situation in our planet, whenever there's an injustice, there are victims, there are perpetrators, there are collaborators, and that cycle can continue. For slavery, it continued for hundreds of years. For Nazis, maybe just 
two or three, but it can continue for a long time until the bystanders get involved. All those bystander buffalo, they were the only ones that could actually come in and stop what was happening. In other words, the bystanders have all the power to make change which is not something that we usually think of ourselves as bystanders and being able to do. Here's the next one. Remember that one courageous buffalo? Changed everything. And all the other buffaloes got it. One courageous buffalo, they all suddenly became courageous. Few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence. Yet it is the one essential vital quality for those who seek to change a world which yields most painfully to change. The courage of us allows us to escape the evilness that we have in our world. And I think it's something that we all know deep down when something is wrong. And I'm now convinced too that even animals know this and people have disagreed with me on it, but I'll just show you this one cat video to prove that animals too have an idea of right and wrong. Fashion is an art of personal expression. It is the democratization of style. The power of personal expression is in the world's bystanders, is the power that changes the world. Regrets of the dying and then we'll end. There's this amazing woman. She's a palliative care nurse, meaning she takes care of people that only have two or three weeks left to live. And she asked them always, what were your biggest regrets in your life? And it turned out that people had the same five regrets. And the number one regret was that they wished that they had had the courage to not live the life that others expected of them. Meaning, they went through their life doing sort of what others expected rather than pursuing their dreams or taking a bold stance. In fact, you know, the third one on there was the courage to express their feelings. Maybe we get the others, the courage to not work on this treadmill of work existence, staying in touch with your friends, letting yourself laugh. Paul Graham, he runs a Y Combinator in Silicon Valley. It's an incredibly insightful quote for a guy who runs an uh, accelerator. He says, the five regrets paint a portrait of a post-industrial person who shrinks into a shape that fits their circumstances and then turn dutifully till they stop. Meaning, we become a cog. We sort of just do what's expected of us and never venture out. And I can tell you, cogs are not very valuable because they're easily replaced, and it doesn't make for much of a fulfilling life either. The only way to break out is to do something courageous, and if you have to, run like hell. It's the only way to break out of cognism. And if you're wondering yourself, well, you know, I'm just not really a courageous person. What I've learned from watching people who win sort of medals of courage is that never once have any of those ever done something to win a medal of courage. Or even to be courageous. They always do it for the same reasons, which is they had compassion for somebody. They had compassion for their fellow police officer or their fellow soldier or for their fellow country. And that compassion gave them all the courage they needed. In other words, if you want to grow your courage, grow your compassion and the courage comes with that for free. I'll end with this. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the judgment that something else is more important than fear, like compassion. The brave may not live forever, but the cautious do not live at all. Thank you very much.
Let's just have a moment of quiet because it's uh, that's good. Okay. Um, I just came back from Davos and uh, I interviewed a number of people who led the Paris climate talks, Cristiano Figueres, uh, Rachel Kite from the World Bank, etc., etc. And they all said that the pa- that what was in Paris was the feeling of love, that it was it was a palpable feeling of love. So all these politicians, business leaders, they all said love was present. Um, So my question is that are we going through a fundamental change of consciousness, which is that we've gone so far to an extreme that obviously we go in cycles, we we get out of balance, we get to an extreme, either things get knocked out or they come back into balance. What what do you think is happening? So are we entering a new, because you know some of the faith groups say we're entering a new era of consciousness. Uh, it's only consciousness that will save the world. As you say, technologies won't, consciousness will. Do, do you feel we're fundamentally going through a change in consciousness? Wow. Um, I think we're entering a stage where we have to. I mean, never before have we actually really worried that we might tilt things on the planet so much that we can't recover from it. Now, for the first time, we're having to face that reality. And even if we don't experience it, our children might. (laughs) And I think we all can have a compassion for our own children. And if we don't get that compassion, then we face a pretty ugly future. That compassion buys us everything. Without it, I don't know that we can be proud of ourselves. Even if we accomplish great things with all of our technology, we've still got to get there and be proud of what we are. <laughs> so last thing, which is, you know, you, you've taken us into our feelings. Um, I'm going to take, not take us out of them, but, but, you know, everyone here is here, hopefully, because they believe they can make that difference. And what's the one thing, I mean, I, just out of everything you've said, but also the one thing that people would put in their back pocket when they go home yeah. that they will not forget. Yeah. I mean, I think it's this idea of moral courage about we know when something isn't right and we can stay silent and be a bystander or we can speak up. <laughs> and so often, because we're busy, because of you know, 50 other reasons, we might not say something. And we need to because it's that expression, which really is, I think, to the essence of fashion, it's that expression that um, frees us from all of the things that we don't, don't want. So, moral courage. Great. David, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you.